In the name of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, preaching is a perilous thing. You just don't know what's happening. Are the words being heard? And if they're being heard, are they being understood? And it's a big deal, this preaching thing. Paul puts a lot. Paul puts almost everything on preaching in Romans 10. How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? For that very reason, in one of his sermons, Dr. Luther called the church a mouth house, a place where words are spoken, where there's talking, where there's preaching. In that same sermon, he noted how Jesus wrote nothing but said everything. Words are to be spoken. God's words are to be preached. But what happens to those words? Some hear them and say, well, he couldn't possibly be talking to me. And they mean, God couldn't possibly address someone like me, someone as wretched and, and pathetic and, and sinful as I am. Some hear and say, well, he couldn't be talking to me. And they mean, God couldn't possibly address someone like me, someone as good as me, them maybe, but not me. And that's the peril of preaching, the deaf ear. But our Lord Jesus himself said once, repeatedly, actually, he who has ears, let him hear. Well, we all have ears. And the words of God are for all of us, all of them. For us, even in our lowest moments, in our most wretched patheticness, in our most mea culpa moments, our most mea maxima culpa moments. And they're for us in our best moments, in our highest highs, in our moments of the greatest confidence. If only we would hear them. Like David. David went deaf. For a while. As he celebrated his new wife Bathsheba, as he rejoiced in the news of the coming birth of a son, David couldn't hear very well. I don't suppose he went around boasting and bragging about the things he had done to win Bathsheba, but, but maybe there was some smug satisfaction, some silent confidence in David because he'd managed to solve a problem named Uriah. I didn't kill him. It was the enemy's arrows that killed him. It's all good. No more culpa here. And I even made an honest woman out of her. Until one day Nathan shows up, Nathan the prophet, David's pastor, and tells him the story of a rich man who took his poor neighbor's only sheep to selfishly serve him as the meal to a guest. And, and David rose in anger, and Nathan said, Sit down, because you're the man. Or there are the Corinthians, the Corinthians who couldn't seem to keep it in their pants. Because, you know, after all, the food for the body and the body for food. God gave me these sexual organs, right? They asked Paul to use, right? I'm a man. That's what I do. But that same lack of self-control also exhibited itself in other ways. The Corinthians were taking each other to court. Christians suing Christians continually, constantly making a mockery of love your neighbor before the pagan world. He wronged me. Shall I not be revenged, they said? I can't let him trample my rights. And Paul starts making a list of the things that exclude one from the kingdom of God, the, the greeds and the depravities and the sexual immoralities and the rights seized and taken. And then the Corinthians look at each other and say, well, he ain't talking to us. Until Paul says, and that's what some of you were. Or these Ephesians that Paul writes to now. Maybe these Ephesians began to really bask in the glow of the eternal election Paul has preached to them and written to them about. Maybe they've even begun to misuse this teaching on election, use it as a crutch, as a license for liberty or despair. Despair. 
Maybe they've begun to use it as a weapon against the Jews that, that live among them. Maybe they've begun to use it as a way to whitewash their sinful pasts and their sinful present. So Paul comes and he shakes them up a bit. You were once nothing to God. Remember that, you Gentiles? Recall that distinction. The world can be divided into two groups of people according to the reckoning of the Old Testament. Jews and all the rest. Gentiles. The nations. The uncircumcised. Now, to be fair, Jews aren't the only culture that did something like that. Greeks were good at doing this, too. The Greeks divided the world into two groups. They lumped everyone into one of two parties, those who spoke Greek and all the rest of the language. They called them barbarians, because that's what it sounded like to them when someone spoke something other than eloquent, civilized Greek. Bar, 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 bar. And we do the same thing, too, whether we're talking about American or not. Unwashed, unenlightened, uneducated not on the right side of history, liberal, conservative, Christian, non-Christian, white, not white, young, old. But Paul grabs the distinction that these Ephesian Christians were dealing with. Gentile. You were nothing to God, he said. God didn't choose you. He chose the children of Israel. He chose the children of Abraham, and he cleansed them, and he left you unclean. Remember when one of you Gentiles made it? It was a kind of unique thing. Rahab, Ruth, Naaman. But he left you out. God excluded you from the promises. No home, no covenants, no God. You were far away. You were enemies, hostile. You were separate and divided. Hatred stood between the two of you. And it wasn't because God's some kind of chauvinist pig. Practicing, practicing the, the reverse of anti-Semitism, anti-Goyism, anti-Gentilism. It was you, you Gentiles. You. Your sins. Dead in sin. The sins you lived in. You followed the ways of this world. You followed after the prince of the air, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. All of us, Paul said, all of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. What a word. Paul eviscerates these Gentile Christians at the same time as he emasculates the Jews. All of us, he says. Paul tells the same story in his letter to the Romans in the first three chapters. He lays out how the wrath of God is being poured out upon the nations, upon the Gentiles, because of their idolatries and their adulteries, even also because of their homosexual behavior, that, that sinful behavior that God had thrust upon them, that God had pushed them into because of their sins. And just, just as Paul's Jewish readers are starting to clap their hands giddily and gladly, like maybe we proud Christian heterosexuals do, Paul turns on them and says, You... What are you doing? Why do you think you get to talk? Who are you? You have the very words of God. And look at you. You lie, you cheat, you steal, and you commit adultery like the rest. It is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. And so Paul concludes that all alike, Jew and Gentile, stand condemned before God. You can say nothing to God. You can't stand before God. As much as you hate them and they over there, God hates you all the more. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. And that's the very peril of preaching. What happens next? Despair. There can't possibly be any reason for hope now. In one ear and out the other? Yeah, you guys better listen to what Paul has to say to you here tonight. Paul takes the risk. Paul takes the great leap. And it's in one of those tiny phrases. But now. That same phrase came out in Romans chapter 3. It was in verse 21. After Paul had condemned Jew and Gentile alike under sin, 
He turned the corner and said, But now, but now a righteousness from God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. And this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And he did it to the Ephesians as well. In verse 13 of chapter 2, But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Paul takes the leap. The Holy Spirit takes the leap through Paul. Paul risks everything to preach this word. Even though it's possible that you might hear and say, No, Paul, things are too bad. They're too far gone for a but now. Even though you might hear and say, no, Paul, there's no way things are so bad that I need a but now. But still, Paul takes the leap. Paul risks everything to preach this word. He preaches it because you have ears. Hear it, I beg you. Hear it because this is the difference between life and death. Or in Paul's terms here in chapter 2, between being far or near, between war and peace, being two or one. We would say that we're not Jews, not anything like them, never have been, never will be, because we've been so near to God from almost the moment of our birth, brought near, at peace, one with God, since he washed us in his holy and precious water of baptism, bathing us in the blood of Christ. But you know what they say, never kid a kidder. Tell me. Tell me that there is no they in your vocabulary. No them. Unwashed. Uncircumcised. Tell me that there is no compromise, no settling things with Satan to soothe the clanging conscience because you'd much rather just keep on doing what you're doing rather than say not and actually pleasing God. Tell me. Tell me that there is no murder and no adultery, no illicit sex, no greed. Tell me that as you cry out, Gentile, barbarian, close the gates. I've got ears. Tell me, if you can. Or is there only silence? Silence as the law of God demands, as the law of God silences you. You have no standing before him. What word absolves you of your responsibility for your crimes, for your sins? Only a word that comes from God. Only a word that comes from outside of you. Only a word that is so unexpected that in Ephesians 3, Paul calls it a mystery. But now, But now, you mean Gentiles are welcome in the kingdom of God? Well, then why get circumcised? You mean those who are far away are brought near? They're at peace? The two are one? How can it be? Well, it's not because of you. It's not because of your compromising or your corner cutting. It's not because of your birth or your membership in any organization. It's not because of any wonderful works you managed to perform. It's nothing except God's but now. But now in Christ Jesus. And then Paul drives it home in his flesh, in his blood, in his body, in his cross. The but now is Christ alone. This is the moment when a film critic might find reason to criticize God's plot. He might point to this and say, oh, it's nothing but the deus ex machina, the God out of the machine. It's that moment in theater when a deity conveniently appears without any foreshadowing, without any probability to save the day unexpectedly. But it's not improbable. It's only unasked for. And it's not unheard of. It's only unlistened to. He who has ears, let him hear. A distance existed. A wall divided. Hatred kept apart. We created it. 
and God disposed of it. He broke down the wall. He dissolved the hatred. They mingled with the flesh and blood of God himself, and this flesh and blood of God brought us near, closed the gap. This hatred between the races, this hatred between peoples, this hatred between God and man, it died when Jesus died. Like the sacrifices of the Old Testament, the blood of God himself brought us near. Centuries ago, when some were translating the Old Testament into English, they searched for a word, a word that would express the meaning of the Old Testament festival, Yom Kippur. They searched for a word that would express the idea of sacrifice, putting the sins of the people on this goat, sending the goat out and then sacrificing another in the place of the people. This word that would identify the idea behind Jesus' sacrifice, his flesh, his blood, his cross, and they had to invent a word. Atonement. At one moment. But only in Christ. In Christ, whose flesh took all this guilt, whose flesh took all these condemnations, whose flesh took all these divine demands upon himself, becoming truly our sin, even, even as he obeyed God his Father perfectly. And there in him, in his blood, in his flesh, at this cross, Jesus reconciled the two into one. And we're not just talking about reconciling the races. We're not just talking about reconciling Jew and Gentile. We're talking about reconciling God and man. Because there at the cross of Christ, God's justice and God's mercy met. There at the cross, in his flesh, in Jesus' blood, there God was just. Punishing sin, hating sin, hating sinners. And there he was the justifier, declaring not guilty, declaring righteous those who are in Christ, in his flesh, in his blood, in his cross. Which leads to something astounding. Access. Access to God, Paul says. Access to God means the ability to repent and confess. To know and feel true terror over sin. But the same moment to know what the prodigal son knew. About the open, loving, and forgiving arms of a father. Access means to know that you can call God not enemy, but Father. Access means the ability to pray, Oh, Father, dear Father, forgive me, feed me, lead me. Preaching is such a perilous thing. We just don't really know what the results are going to be. But we can be sure of our preaching when we let it be God's preaching. God brings his eternal election to us in time through his apostles and prophets, that is, through his word, a word that is never separate from Christ. A word where God brings us near to himself. A word where God removes our sins. A word where God transforms our lives, transforms our hearts, transforms our minds, transforms our bodies. A word that calls us sinners that calls us Gentiles, that calls us them. But a word that in Christ, and in his blood, and in his flesh, then also calls us saints. Declared so. Living so. In Christ. He who has ears, let him hear. I beg you. Amen. Amen.